Brothers and sisters, if we could sum up the entire Christmas experience in terms of our faith, we could sum it up with one word, and that's gift. Gifts are very powerful ways that we can express love to one another when they are given with the right intention. Certainly we know that there are some people who give gifts for the wrong intentions. But when somebody who truly loves us and truly knows us and truly knows our hearts gives us a gift, they typically give us something that blesses us and brings us joy. And that is what we see happening with us this evening. We enter into the gift that is Christmas. We give gifts to each other, rejoicing. In the love that we have received from God. That gift that God has given to us. And yet, sometimes gifts, you know, when we're exchanging them, human gifts can sometimes disappoint. For the past couple years, in the, among the staff, we've done this Yankee swap. right? You know, where you get one gift and then you, everybody picks a number and that kind of a thing. I'd never heard of it until I came up here to the north. We didn't have Yankee swaps in the south. I guess the name of it is a Yankee swap for a reason. So last year, I got one of those white noise maker. Great, wonderful for my office. Mm -hmm. Yay. It's good. I use it. You know, when I have an appointment, I turn it on. Makes the white noise so that nobody can actually overhear what's going on, so that people who are coming to confession in the office, they appreciate that. This year, I got a salad bowl. (laughs) Now, I'm grateful I didn't get the scratch tickets because might as well just throw the money away. Write me a check instead of buying me scratch tickets. But with the gift that God gives, we know that it's not something that we we might understand at first. The people of Israel, they kept hearing this news about the Savior. They kept hearing God speaking to them. And they could have said, yeah, right. We haven't been seeing this. We've been seeing disappointment after disappointment. But God has made promises, and he is not a man that he should lie. Nor is he a woman that he should lie. But God is faithful to his promises. And what we celebrate is that fact, that historical, tangible fact that God made the promise to become one of us, to take on our humanity and to send us the Savior, his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. But this reminds us, brothers and sisters, that what God has promised to do for us in the future, he will also accomplish. Because if he has done things that he has promised, he will also do things that he has promised. But we remember something else. Kind of like how people will give teaser presents to somebody, right? To get them interested in the big present that they might have for their birthday or for Christmas. God does the same thing. But the teaser presents aren't always very, they're not always obvious, right? They're kind of mysterious. They might kind of stir up the curiosity. What am I getting? Because you're giving me this thing. And it doesn't seem like that makes sense as to what I might be getting. We can see Joseph, the son of David, going through this very process. He has been married to his wife contractually, according to the Jewish custom of the time, to first take your vows, then the Spouse, the, the bridegroom, is supposed to go and prepare a place, takes about a year or so, in the house of his father, to then come back with his friends after his father has said everything is good with the, with the dwelling place that he's constructed, and take the bride and her friends to the house to have the wedding feast. And the first night of the wedding feast then is supposed to be the consummation. So Mary and Joseph were already married. They were already technically husband and wife. They hadn't yet entered into the communal living aspect. Married people, can you imagine waiting about a year after making your vows to have the honeymoon? 
right? Aren't we glad that's not the case today? But Joseph finds some disturbing news. He finds out that Mary is pregnant. And of course, in his own given humanity, with his own human understanding, he thinks that only one thing has happened, that Mary has betrayed him. It takes God to interrupt Joseph's life and to show him that what is being given to him at this moment is not a curse, it's not a catastrophe, it's a blessing in disguise of something that he would never expect, that God would decide to have somebody conceived by the Holy Spirit. We see Joseph, he wakes up from the dream, and what he doesn't do is he doesn't call a press conference. Right? Yes? Right, okay. He doesn't write a book, Joseph, my dream experience. You can know what I know. Instead, in the traditional understanding of faith, he acts on what has been given to him. He acts on it. Jesus, in his preaching, tells us quite clearly that if we act on his word, we are like people who build their house on stone, that when the wind comes up and the river rises, the creek rises sometimes, right? You ever hear that? God willing, the creek don't rise, right? Or as my mom would say, the crick. Brother Damien, did they say that down in in D.C.? The crick, yeah. Okay. So when the wind rises and the river rises and the wind and everything batters against that house, it stands firm, not because somebody knew something or heard something or got an A-plus on a religion test, but because they put the word into practice. And Jesus said that those who do not act on his word are like those who build their house on sand. The same trial and tribulation comes up, the wind, the rain, the river, the flood, And the house is swept away because there's no foundation. James, the apostle, also reminds us the same thing. He says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I liken it like this. If somebody says to you, I have a present for you, and it's a free gift, like it's somebody who loves you and you know is giving you a gift to bless you. It's not somebody who's trying to give you a gift to manipulate you. I've had that happen before as a priest. Long story, I sent the present back. <laughs> Pajamas that said, looking for love in all the wrong places. Yeah, that, that person was <laughs> looking for love in all the wrong places. So, <laughs> so we know that if somebody is giving you a gift, you don't just say, yay, I'm going to get a gift, and then do nothing, right? No, you have to actually go to the person's house or invite the person over. You have to actually receive the gift. And when you receive the gift, what do you have to do? Rip it open. open. Right, kids get this because they're smart. You have to open the gift. And then once you open the gift, what do you have to do? You have to figure out what it is. What is it? Now, Now it's been uncovered. Now you have to understand what is it, right? That's the next part. And then, when you understand what it is, you then realize what you can do with it. Wow, I can do X, Y, Z with this. Yay. You know, I was messing around with the salad bowl. I put it on my head and I used the spoons as like an instrument because I figured at least I could do that. Right? <laughs> so when you, when, you, when you see these things, you know, it doesn't mean that because you have to participate that you're earning the gift, right? You just have to participate In some way. Not like where some people says, unless you do X, Y, Z, I'm not giving you anything. Well, that's not a gift. That's bribery, right? That's manipulation. So there's been some interesting things that God has been doing when we decide to act on his word. I say we, not me, we. I mentioned this whole thing about acting on the word and led some students at Bishop Girton to act on the word by inviting God to give them the graces that he wants to give them. And a couple kids were healed 
during communion. I even asked them, I said, hey, I noticed that there was a shift. I felt a shift. You know, does anybody feel different? Some, like 14 kids raised their hands. Does anybody have any measurable healing, physical healing? One kid testified that his knee had gone from about a two or three pain to zero. And then the next Friday, the same thing happened here. God decided to, to, to heal. And I mentioned it to people that it was happening. And somebody came up for healing after Mass. And God healed the guy's back. He had a 7 out of 10 pain. Some of you know him, Joe Gags. Excuse me, Joe Gagliardi. He's, he's not a joke to anybody. He's, he's, a, he's a big heart. And then Sunday, the following Sunday, as people were acting on the word during the homily, two people told me afterwards they got healed. And one person told me that their headache went away. And that's a surprise to me because I think my long homilies would give people headaches, not the opposite effect, right? And then at the 6 p.m. Mass, somebody said that their leg pain went away also during the Mass, that it was hurting them excruciatingly. So we see something going on that when we act on what God has promised us, when we say yes to God, and when we do something with what we know and understand about God, not just knowing, in our culture and in the world in general, they like to exalt knowledge for the sake of knowledge. And we're not against knowledge. We as a church have sponsored knowledge and education from the, the time that people call the Dark Ages, which I think is funny because the learning that was going on was actually being instituted by the church. So, there. Anyway, <laughs> wait, no, I can't drop a mic. Okay. All right. So, we're not against knowledge. It's just we know that that's not the end. It's not what we know about God. It's that we know him personally. It's not what we know about God theolo theologically. It's that we trust God. It's that we enter into relationship with God. I have met people who maybe didn't have a theological understanding of God, but their hearts were very close. So today being Christmas, it's Jesus' birthday, and in Mediterranean cultures, actually the birthday boy is supposed to give the presents to everybody else. I found that out in Italy. So people wanted to know when my birthday was because they wanted me to give them gifts. <laughs> But also we're in the United States, so I think we can give Jesus a gift today as well. One of the biggest things that the Lord wants is very simply put, he wants us to receive. I know that sounds crazy to some people. Folks who are used to giving or thinking that we have to earn what God has given to us or that, that we have to be good before God will bless us. This is not what Jesus came to teach us. He came to teach us. The good news, that is, that the kingdom is near. God loves us tremendously. He wants to forgive us our sins. He's only looking for us to change our hearts, to ask him for the help that we need in order to become saints. And he will do that if we let him. He wants us to let him in as Lord. To have him have that intimate relationship. But... Let's face it, just like people, in our relationships with people, we have to know how far do we want the Lord in, in our lives. Some of us, you know, we have some people that are on the outskirts of our lives, and it's good that we keep them there, right? Other people who are maybe acquaintances, others who are friends, and then we have the intimate friends and family members who we can trust with our heart. The Lord is asking of us that we give him our hearts, and what better way to honor Jesus' birthday than to give him that gift today? So, if you would, humor me a moment, okay? If you would, take your heart in your hand, if you would. Just pretend, okay? And extend it to Jesus in your imagination and say, Jesus, Jesus, happy birthday. Here's my heart. I give you all of me. I give you all my spirit, all my soul, and my entire body. I love you, Jesus. And I thank you for the gift you have given me. Jesus, 
I know that nothing pleases your heart more than if I say yes to everything you have for me. So Jesus, I receive your heart. And every gift you want to give me, not only today, but for all eternity. Amen.